I, I think I'd start by just commenting on this event itself. I graduated from the GSB 10 years ago, and I don't think you would have seen something like what Net Impact has pulled uh, together here in this conference. It really, I, this is a special time, and I see it in the work that TechnoServe does, the kind of people who want to come and work at organizations like TechnoServe or Acumen. There's a real spirit among, I would just say this generation, I'll count myself in the generation, um, <laughs> that says, I'm talented, um, I've got a lot to offer in the world, and I want to use some of those talents for some part of my life to make a difference. And I would also say it reflects the fact that there are more and more opportunities to do that. We're no longer thinking I'm private sector or I'm nonprofit. Uh, th those lines are blurring, and I think that's just a great thing. Um, we're going to try to keep the presentations brief and uh, use most of this for question and answer. So let me just real quickly, a couple things, tell you a little bit about TechnoServe, and then a couple thoughts on broader opportunities in international development for, for business people. Um, TechnoServe, our tagline is business solutions to rural poverty. And that's a pretty apt definition of what we do. So I'll just stop there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were actually founded almost 40 years ago uh, by a businessman, Ed Bullard, who was probably one of the original social entrepreneurs. Um, he was uh, um, um, in a manufacturing family, running a manufacturing plant in Connecticut, went to Ghana for a year with his church and had a life-changing experience there. Came back and thought, I want to do something uh, to help the people in Ghana, but I want to use what I know about business to do it. Uh, it was about market-based solutions back in 1968, the problems that he saw with primarily smallholder farmers in Ghana. Uh, and that's what they started doing back then, and that's what's motivated TechnoServe since. Today we're about 350 uh, people worldwide, well, I'll say worldwide, Africa and Latin America. Um, those men and women are primarily business people, uh, typically from the countries in which we're working, who have worked in business and or have MBAs, and they are applying business skills as business solutions to rural poverty. Um, I should also say we have a sort of a nascent McKinsey mafia uh, developing at TechnoServe, too. I think we're one of the largest employers of ex-McKinsey consultants in the nonprofit world. Some might think that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I do. Um, what we do, it, broadly speaking, two larger sets of activities. The first I'd call um, business development services, and the second entrepreneurship capacity building. And when I talk about business development services, it really is an entrepreneur-driven, industry-based approach to agribusiness, typically, because we're working in rural contexts. And so it is thinking analytically as we go into a country about what are the real sources of comparative or competitive advantage in that particular country. Resources are always going to be scarce. Let's not be scattershot in our approach. Let's place some bets on sectors where we think we can make a difference. And then it's doing some of the things that you do in business or in business school. It's thinking about supply chains, thinking about the supply chain that gets from the field ultimately to the table, because typically, again, these are crop, uh, crop products, and think where along that supply chain, where along that value chain can we make a difference? Can we intercede to add value and then ultimately to bring value back closer to the farmer, to the poor farmers that we ultimately are serving. Uh, and this is a set of skills that you're honing in the private sector uh, and that you're using every day. And they're world-class skills often. Um, and some of you should talk to John Fung. I was just talking with John. John just spent six months with us in Mozambique. And the subject was, you know, are there value chain opportunities for livestock feed and oilseed production? Well, it's a, it's, it turns out to be a complex question, and it takes a certain set of skills to work your way through that. That's how we start the engagement, though. Then we're identifying that entrepreneur, that small business, around which we can begin to attack those challenges along that value chain. Um, and this is a pretty intense engagement. And again, this is about the person who's losing sleep about, is this endeavor going to survive or not? Because in development, really that's the key to sustainability. Uh, if there's not somebody who cares deeply about making sure that the work continues, it won't. Uh, and typically, those people are entrepreneurs. And you know them. You know them here. We know them in the developing world. Um, and we work with them on refining business models, getting the business plan written, getting in place the operational, financial, marketing resources needed to build businesses, and then building businesses. And sometimes that involves actual uh, building. We're building factories in some instances. Uh, it's getting those businesses up and running to scale and then replicating that experience. The impact we ultimately hope to have 
is not at the at the business level but at the industry level and so we do that kind of work we do it in you know and there you know a year and a half ago i didn't think a lot about agribusiness but it's products like processing cashews in mozambique where we've built the process cashew industry from nothing to they'll have eight million dollars in revenues this year among eleven entrepreneurs employing several thousand people and buying product from fifty thousand poor farmers we're doing this with coffee in Tanzania, and if any of you were in Pete's, and I'll bet some of you were, uh, a month ago, uh, the featured coffee in Pete's was uh, Tanzania Kilimanjaro. And that came from Kili Cafe, TechnoServe, business, uh, a shareholder association of smallholder farmers, about 7,000 smallholder farmers who were producing, producing world quality coffee and selling it in the United States. We're doing it now with Artemisia in Tanzania. Artemisia is the critical plant ingredient in the recommended anti-malarial treatment and there's a shortage of it around the world. It's grown now in China and Vietnam. The World Health Organization wants to see it grown more broadly. We think the private sector ought to do it. So we are working with smallholder farmers in Tanzania to, on the cultivation of Artemisia and work with the small business on the extraction of the Artemisinin from that plant. And then we're in a partnership with Novartis ultimately for the, for the production of the actual medicine itself. Um, in Honduras, we're working to revive the cocoa industry. We're taking a factory out of bankruptcy with a local entrepreneur working with the government to kickstart an industry that was just r ravaged uh, by the hurricane in, in 1998. It's those kinds of approaches. And again, it's starting at the business level. You've got to start there. You've got to get the model right. And then it's building it out to have a broader impact. And then the second set of things I, I refer to is, you know, a lot of these countries, there just aren't role model examples of real entrepreneurial success. And there aren't means of imparting those set of skills that entrepreneurs need. So we run nationwide business plan competitions. Uh, these are actually a model we took from McKinsey that they developed for in West Germany at one point. They took it to South Africa. We took it from there and are using it. We've run competitions in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala. We're running one now in Kenya with uh, Google sponsorship. Now we're running a business plan competition in Ghana. And we think it's a great way to it actually does produce entrepreneurs at the other end. Now, you go in as an entrepreneur or you're not going to succeed. Uh, but it does provide that set of skills and tools to get you to the next level. We also run youth entrepreneurship uh, programs in various countries and engage in a, in a smattering of other business-related activities, particularly around policy reform, uh, which is critical to getting the enabling environment uh, for businesses to uh, succeed. So that, in a sort of a nutshell, uh, is our approach. I would just say about opportunities for business people uh, in development, broadly I'd say there's, well, three. I'm, I worked at McKinsey, we have three. Uh, the first is uh, go out in the world and work in corporations because ultimately it's self-interest is going to drive a lot of, corporate self-interest is going to drive a lot of development in the developing world if corporations are aware that they're actually markets for their goods in developing countries. This is the bottom of the pyramid concept. Uh, there are also sources of inputs uh, into supply chains in, developing, in the developing world that can be very profitable for companies. So it just takes a certain consciousness raising and an approach. You've got to think about business models a little differently, but there is money to be made in the develop, developing world. Uh, I'd say the second broad thing is helping to develop indigenous businesses in these countries. Again, that is the key to sustainable development uh, in a lot of these third, in all of these third world countries. Um, and it's organizations like Acumen, like TechnoServe, uh, people on the ground doing it. There are many, many very good local NGOs that do this kind of work. So it's getting involved, directly involved in those kind of kinds of organizations that really provides a jump start to the kind of development we're talking about. Um, and I think the final thing I would suggest is advocacy. The business community can be a powerful motivator uh, for societal change. And you see it in uh, organizations like the uh, Global, uh, the Initiative for Global Development, which is actually started by Bill Gates Sr. and Bill Rockleshouse in Seattle. It's trying to get business people in various cities involved in thinking about advocacy for international development. The Global Business Coalition on HIV and AIDS, it's a powerful group of business people coming together to advocate for change, for change that uh, addresses fundamental uh, problems, in this case, problems of HIV AIDS. It's actually organizations like Net Impact, uh, organizations that care about these issues, that involve business people who can have a voice in society in uh, setting the agenda for change. Um, so with that, let me just stop and let Thank Pamela you, Bruce. Take it away. Yeah. Pamela? Yeah.
Well, I'm always incredibly impressed when I uh, come to Stanford. I think my IQ goes up like 50 points. Um, <laughs> the amazing thing is I've just flown in from Chile, and when I told people in Chile what it was that I was going to be coming here for, they absolutely could not believe that there was a group of students that was organizing this kind of an event that was bringing you all by the thousands, and they just thought that was absolutely phenomenal. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I guess I'll start out, we're, um, we're quite different from either. Te TechnoServe, in fact, is part of our community of outstanding uh, social entrepreneurs. But um, one of the things that we had to decide very early on in the foundation's beginning was um, what was better than a foundation that gave away tens of millions of dollars? And we came up with the idea that it was a foundation that didn't invest a penny and didn't give grants or didn't really directly invest financially, but actually leveraged its unique connection to major captains of industry, leaders in government, to influence their mindsets and to leverage and, and begin to think through a different kind of model, a different kind of capitalism, a sustainable model of capitalism. Uh, when we talk about the bottom of the pyramid, I always get a little bit worried because there's also the other side of the pyramid. It's not just about getting you know, businesses down to the local level, which is, of course, important, but it's also allowing for a whole series of other development processes that have to happen at the community level in order for those folks to be able to engage in business in a real way. Um, I'm often asked, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've achieved, first of all. We set out, we're, we're five years old, and we looked back and said, has this been a good strategy? Has this leverage idea been a good strategy? And we canvassed our 72 social entrepreneurs, 81 social entrepreneurs and 72 organizations, and asked them, if the Schwab Foundation had not been around, what difference would it have made to you? And we found out something very interesting, shocking, actually, for me which was that last year, our community of social entrepreneurs, thanks directly to our efforts, mobilized $77 million for their activities. Not only that, many of them collectively say that as a result of that expansion, they have uh, been able to multiply the direct number of beneficiaries 3.5 times. They've been able to scale out to other countries, in many cases, you know, several countries at a time. And on the other hand, because of our direct intervention, they have received other awards and a lot of media attention. So when we look back and look at the very small resource base from which we're operating and look at how we have had to be forced to be entrepreneurial, we are not a large organization. There are six of us today. And we are able to um, be able to have some, you know, some kind of an impact that does make a difference. Um, one of the questions that I'm asked the most frequently when I go around the world is, how can you, can you teach me to be entrepreneurial? Can you teach me to be an entrepreneur? And I always sort of, you know, it's very, it's a tough question to get asked. And I say, okay, you know what? Think about the answers to these four questions. First of all, do you need to have the approval of your family and your friends and your colleagues as to the career path you choose? Number two, does the idea of failure basically make you run to the drugstore for a tranquilizer. Number three, uh, do you think that government should be responsible or primarily responsible for undertaking all social and economic uh, or social activities that need to do with um, greater equity, promoting greater equity? And number four is basically the issue about do you really spend any less than 24 hours a day obsessing about how you're going to make this model work. And finally, I say, does your idea of a great career mean a steady job, a monthly salary, paid vacations, and a nice retirement package? And if you've answered yes to any one of those questions, chances are you are not an entrepreneur. And you know, they kind of look at me and I say, don't worry, I'm not an entrepreneur either. And, you know, I mean, sure, some people think I'm kind of nutty, but, but I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I support <laughs> entrepreneurs. And the reality is that there are really very few of those kinds of people out there. And so I am convinced after working, you know, for years with these kinds of folks that it's in their DNA. They can't help being the way they are. But 
you know, as Bruce says, the context is extremely important for how they will develop. And that's what we try to promote at the country level is really having governments, having the private sector look at what is it that you're doing to promote entrepreneurial talent so that you can take advantage of the pool of entrepreneurs in, in your population. Um, I look at my adopted country right now, France, which is having a horrible time. And I can tell you that one of the reasons why that is the case is because entrepreneurship is totally stifled in France. And you're not allowing these communities to really seize opportunities and create their own destinies through dignity. So that's one major issue. Um, I'd just like to highlight two models of uh, social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that I've just seen. Uh, one in Chile and one in Nigeria that I think uh, are examples of what is happening in these countries. You know, the United States, probably its greatest export is entrepreneurship. But in many countries, that isn't the case. So it's very exciting for me to discover when, uh, you know, you really see people emerging like this. One that I just saw was a guy named Fernando Nilo, and he started an enterprise called Recicla Chile. He is the only recycling company of electronic waste in all of Latin America. And he saw this enormous opportunity of, for example, in his own country, 65% of the population own mobile phones. What happens to those phones after they've you know, had their lifetime of use? Well, they get thrown out. And as you all know, that is a very big source of environmental waste. Same with computers, same with scanners, faxes, all those things that we rely on. So what he has done is he has started a company that basically accepts and urges and does a huge public awareness campaign to get people to uh, give them those used things. And then, interestingly enough, he hires ex-prisoners to help them dismantle that waste, package it up, and send it to exporters in Europe who are uh, who really know how to reprocess and, and, uh, and uh, you know, get rid of this stuff in a, in a, in a sustainable and environmentally friendly way. Uh, he's turning a profit for the first time this year, and he's desperately looking for investors. People in his country think he's nuts. So, you know, where is that middle, where is, is that missing middle that's going to invest in these kinds of enterprises? We really are looking at a completely different kind of model, as Bruce, you know, mentioned, a completely different way of owner, looking at ownership of a company, a completely different way of looking at supply chains, of looking at human resources, et cetera. The other, and I'll finish with this, is an example from Nigeria that most people think is, you know, if you've ever been to Lagos, I think it's the worst night, the best nightmare on earth, let's put it that way. And Lagos uh, has just, I really have seldom seen so much poverty and misery packed into one place in a such density. This entrepreneur uh, that we have, that, that, I, that I found, who's an amazing guy, his name is Isaac Duro Yaji or something, but his nickname, or AKA, is Otumba Gaddafi. And the reason why is because he was, he, he's about six feet eight, and he was a bodyguard for one of the few good presidents that Nigeria has had, I hope. Um, anyway, so, so the issue was that he was told by his boss that he wanted him to organize a big event, a big party for his son. It was a graduation party. And Isaac went around trying to find mobile toilets, and he discovered that there was no such thing as a mobile toilet in Nigeria. And so he decided to create a company that would manufacture the mobile toilets. And what he has done is really short of astounding. He's one of the only five manufacturers of mobile toilets in all of Africa. The other four are in South Africa. He basically uh, has distributed these to the markets where there are hundreds of thousands of people a day, bus stops, etc. But he has hired what are called the area boys. Area boys are basically the youth gangs that are in these, in, in these pockets. And of course, as you can imagine, the dynamics there is tense. He has hired them as franchises, or fran how do you say, a, a franchise or franchise, anyway, they franchise these. And these guys are actually earning so much more, they get, a 60, they get 60 Nigerian cents on every uh, Nigerian dollar, and they're earning at least 100 times more. Most Nigerians get less than $3 a day. They're earning about 24,000 Nigerian dollars, which is equivalent of about $160 a month. And they're responsible for the maintenance of, of, this, uh, of, the, of the mobile toilet, 
And uh, DMT then, with the 40 cents that it gets, goes around and evacuates um, these, the mobile toilets every, every uh, twice a week. You may think that's kind of, uh, you know. But these guys have used, they've captured the Nigerian sense of humor as well. So they've got these wonderful trucks, and they'll say, you know, shit business is creative business, and, you know, <laughs> things like that. So people are becoming aware of the fact that, number one, it's environmentally sound. Number two, it's just a great way to deal with a public health problem. And it really does dignify the user, okay? I'll stop here, and then on to Jacqueline. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Jacqueline. Um, thanks, thanks, Pamela. I um, I also want to start by saying how thrilled I am to be here and to really build on what um, Bruce and Pamela said. Having graduated from the business school about 15 years ago, there really is a sea change that is just extraordinary, and um, and it's something that we're seeing all over the world too. And what's particularly important at this moment in history is, I, I feel that as a country and as um, as too many nations. Um, right now, Pamela talking about France too, we're spending all of our resources on the issues that divide us and what we really need to be focused on is spending those resources on issues that unite us because right now, probably more than any moment in history, there are so many problems and, and issues that we share in common. Um, clean water is not just for the one in five people in the world who've never had a glass of it, but increasingly for all of us. Disease is is, you almost don't even need to talk about it because with avian flu coming, um, we're, we're getting more and more aware that disease is moving across um, national borders just indiscriminately and global climate change. So to see 1,300 MBAs coming together to say, I want to use my skill set for um, dealing with these issues in lots of different ways because Bruce talked about a model of really building on small businesses and helping them scale by bringing other kinds of networks and resources to bear on them. And Pamela talked about a model that said, let's go out and find these extraordinary entrepreneurs, whether they're in the social sector or in the private sector, and they don't know they're doing social, um, socially oriented work. Let's find ways to help them scale. And then acumen is a little bit in between. What we say is that if we really want to solve problems of poverty, um, particularly water, health, health housing, um, we have to learn how to deliver goods and services in a way that's incredibly affordable for the poor. And affordable doesn't mean that only that everybody is paying the market price because you've gotten the market price down so cheaply. Some people might pay zero. But what we need to do is create ecosystems, if you will, within an enterprise or a system so that um, all people, and certainly the poor, have access to solving their own problems and their own making their own choices. And, and certainly if there's anything I have learned throughout my life in terms of my own personality, and I, I think I probably am that one of those crazy entrepreneurial personalities, um, it, is, it is the dignity that comes with having that choice, the dignity that comes with being able to make your own decision. And, and the on, I increasingly believe that the only kinds of problems um, or solutions to those problems that are sustainable are when individuals have that opportunity to make their own choices. So. The funny thing about starting an organization is you think you know why you've started it when you're starting it, and then the work really teaches you um, not only why you really did start it, and, and in many ways it's just incredibly affirming and then constantly reaffirming, but it also teaches you at a deeper level what it meant to be thinking of the reason of, of why you started it. So my first piece of advice for everyone here is just start working on something and let the, wor and let the work teach you. And then don't be afraid to fail. Just iterate really fast. Um, in fact, fail fast. Um, <laughs> because it's going to happen. It's going to hurt. And then just build on success. And don't be afraid to talk about those failures. And certainly don't be afraid to talk about those successes. Um, so I started Acumen Fund about five years ago, the same time. Um, and, uh, and the idea then was to capitalize on the communications revolution that was taking place with technology, much of it coming out of Silicon Valley right here. Um, this proliferation of individual wealth and the, and the new kind of philanthropists that were seeking different ways of using their, their both their philanthropic resources as well as their um, investment capital. And then this new kind of entrepreneur, which is what Pamela was talking about, kind of working in the interstices of the for-profit and the nonprofit sectors. 
And um, the idea we would, was that we would create this kind of venture fund that would take charitable contributions and turn around and invest equity and loans in both for-profits and non-profits and um, measure everything that we could. And we're learning um, both that it's really hard to measure everything that you can, but that if we don't measure everything, we ultimately aren't going to get any better at doing what we're doing. And frankly, that's been too much the pattern um, in the development space um, at any rate. And then report back in a, in a way that would treat our donors as investors rather than as passive donors. At the same time, we were going to treat our ultimate clients as clients instead of passive recipients of aid. So this is a very active oriented um, kind of thing. Today, Acumen works in five countries. We um, focus, as I said, on delivering housing, health, and water to people who make less than $4 a day. And um, we've got about 100 investors who range from people giving us $10,000 to um, organizations who've given f $5 million and more um, to Acumen Fund. I want to give uh, one example um, that is both politically relevant today and messy. Um, because I think it's, it is important to talk about how this work teaches you and where you don't know and how I think s too often in the world we think of the entrepreneur as um, being too instrumental to how change happens, that it really is the entrepreneur having an idea and then lots of other people coming in to make things work. That's really important about this work. But um, it, it, it pertains to Pakistan, which is not a country I ever thought I would be working in and certainly not a country that I would be um, have, have fallen in love with and um, be so increasingly involved with. But after 9-11, um, Acumen Fund decided that we were going to proactively um, focus on some countries in the Muslim world and build what we were calling um, institutions of civil society. What we learned um, over the, the next year is that most people in the Muslim world didn't know what we were talking about when we talked about the Muslim world, nor did they have any clue of what we were talking about when we talked about civil society. So we had a really hard marketing job, and, um, <laughs> but we did find a few extraordinary individuals, um, and one in particular was a man named Tasneem Siddiqui in, in um, Pakistan. And he was doing this thing called incremental approach to housing for the poor. He's a very, um, been working in slums for 30 years, learned a lot about poverty, who p poor people are, and how do you deliver goods and services to them. So he recognized that um, the problem was land in Pakistan, as it is in many countries, um, in the developing world particularly. And the, the issue was that even if you allocated land to people, so often the mafia, because there is no more corrupt industry in most countries, including the United States, um, in parts than housing. So if you if you gave a person a piece of land, ultimately the mafia would send a lackey in to sit on that land, get the land for them, and immediately would be converted into slums. Another big problem is that if police were involved, corruption often would um, happen too. So he took the very unorthodox approach of um, not letting any police on this community land and asking people that if they wanted the land to build their house, they had to move into this land and for 10 days just be on the land without any house um, and whatever shelter they could do. Um, long story short, he's put about 30,000 people into housing um, by providing these informal mortgages. They're, they're 10 years long and they um, most people, almost everybody pays. And um, it's quite an extraordinary feat that he's done. In a country of 145 million people, however, 90% of whom make less than $3 a day, it's a drop in, a, in the bucket. And when you look at microfinance as a solution, most microfinance organizations save a, f a few, have 100,000, 200,000 um, borrowers, also aren't going to scale. So what we started doing, um, and this is something I didn't think we would be doing, is becoming the entrepreneurs ourselves. Um, was looking around Pakistan and, and trying to understand the situation better. Well, National Bank of Pakistan has 10 million depositors, almost all of whom fall into our category of making less than $4 a day, and just about zero borrowers, in part because they've never really thought about the poor as a constituency f for borrowing, even though they're um, happy repositories of their deposits. So we started talking to the banks around what would it take for us to create a financial mechanism that would allow you to lend to the poor. Um, and who are the poor anyway? Because 85% of the people who work in government are poor. 
And so now you've got all these people with a very, very stable payroll. So it's a pretty easy next step to say, well, why don't you just do a payroll deduction um, for housing? And so we have a, a, a guarantee facility now where we've put up $1.25 million in charitable monies. We leveraged uh, $3.75 million from the Overseas Private Investment Council um, Corporation in the United States, which then has um, inspired, encouraged, provoked, what have you, the National Bank to uh, put up $50 million of its own capital that it's now lending – well, it will start lending in um, January, February to people in our income category, 70 percent of whom will be on this payroll deduction scheme, 30 percent are this very high-risk, self-employed, and we think incredibly bankable um, population that's going to transform the banking system. So when you're a little kid and you think you really can change the world, and then you kind of go through business school in your 30s and you think, forget it. Um, <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> Getting into your 40s is just great because <laughs> you start not really caring what people think about you and realizing that, um, you know, you really can. $1.25 million of charitable monies and um, – and, and we've created a lot of trust in the meantime because we haven't pretended to know the answers by any far stretch of the imagination, but we've been very tough about what we need and what we expect from being at the table. Um, so that's all the good news. Right now, Pakistan is in um, just an incredible crisis. Um, with this earthquake that's happened, we've, we, are, we have 3 million people homeless suddenly, 650,000 homes lost. These are people who've stayed for four generations only to build the homes, um, and they don't have any resources to, to rebuild. Um, it's in the, the northern frontier areas and, and Kashmir, both of which are isolated, dangerous, um, really hard places to work, and, um, and there's not a lot of experience in housing. So. I get this phone call a couple weeks ago um, from two of our investors because part of Acumen's philosophy is that if you don't have skin in the game, we don't bother. Um, and so we have five very, very wealthy, very, very influential investors who are Pakistanis. Um, and um, they called and said, you know, where, where are you? Where's Acumen? And I said, well, we don't do relief. We don't know how to do relief. We barely know how to do housing. And, um, and they said, yeah, but you know how to do it more than most people um, here, not that we do, because we have partners who are Pakistanis. They do, um, and of the of, of the, the three billion dollars that are needed, we have only raised 112 million dollars as a country. Contrast that to five billion um, in the tsunami that was raised in the first two months, um, where you had 100,000 people die in total. We've seen 100,000 people die already. It's estimated that another 400,000 are going to die this winter. Um, it's a really big deal. So when I, um, I was teasing them and saying, you know, am I, are we really the best you can do um, around <laughs> helping here? And, um, and, and, the, and our Pakistani partner said, well, unfortunately for you, yes. Uh, so as leaders, just come and sit down with us and think through what would it take for you to create or at least try to create a blueprint for how you – respond in terms of creating long-term um, reconstruction after a crisis of this proportion. And so we just started on the back of an envelope saying, well, if we could find a design that was less than $1,000, if we can use local materials and local labor so that we would start building an economy, if at least 10 percent of the, of the house's value were done in a loan form because that's our value system, and if we could find a way to raise the other $20 million um, in grants – that would then be kind of the insurance program that didn't exist, if we could find political protection because there is so much corruption, and if we could measure every single step of the way to show the world that there might be a better way to do this, um, maybe we can do it. Um, but we'd have to get really great managers from some of the companies in Pakistan. So I'm going in a couple weeks um, to sit down with the leaders of Pakistan to figure out if this is, might, might be something that we will do. At the end of the day, we might say we can't do it. But what's been so extraordinary to me at a time when there is so much mistrust in the world is that by deciding you're going to do something and to deciding you're going to do it in partnership and deciding that you're going to follow other people's leads and then bring, bringing what you have to the table, not pretending that you can bring something that you don't have, um, we have a real opportunity in the world today to create a, the kind of change that wasn't possible when I was at business school 15 years ago. Because not only do we have in-person relationships, but we can see each other and talk to each other every day. 
And so I just encourage all of you, um, as you're thinking about who you want to be and who you are, um, whether it's the entrepreneur or it's the probably more important role of that number two person who supports the entrepreneur and who is really number one. Really, really, really take it from me um, because entrepreneurs typically aren't great managers. And if you aren't a great manager, you're not going to get a lot done. And so if you're a great manager, realize that that is the most important role you can have in an organization. Um, And just start and just let the work teach you. Um, So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. So that now that we've heard from our wonderful panelists about the great work that they're doing in the world, uh, we'd like to hear from you, your questions. Again, my question was uh, related to international development. There's a school of thought that's, uh, that, that says that basically we're growing at a rate faster than you know, we can support ourselves. And international development, increasing the in income of the people, is really raising the standard of living and basically making them consumers. In increasing the consumers in the world, right? So, I mean, as, as business school students, we're struggling to find our place. Do I want to focus here? Do I want to focus here? Because I don't want to spend myself thin. You know? So, maybe some frameworks or perspectives from your side could give us some insight as to how we make our decisions. And it's um, it, it kind of goes to the, the, the first point I made that we've got um, more in common than we do that separates us um, in today's world. I thought where you were going to go was the population piece, because one of the things that we do know is that as people's income rises, the number of children they have decreases, so that there is a there is a um, a, a positive correlation in terms of reducing population and increasing income. Um, it is a huge issue for us this this notion of consumption, and I actually think we're going to learn a lot from the developing worlds around how to. Um, create more efficient energy technologies, how to create better health systems um, that then the United States can learn from. But what we really need goes beyond enterprise models um, and goes to real uh, moral leadership around what what is the good life and, and, mm-hmm. and how do we want to build a world together because we cannot continue to consume at the, ki- at the pace that we are consuming. I think the most important um, piece of advice I could give, and and perhaps in terms of where you head, I'm 57 years old, and I sort of had to laugh when Jacqueline said over the phone when we were having this discussion about, oh, I don't think any of us are old enough to give advice. And I thought, oh, maybe you're not, but (laughs) I'll (laughs) am. Anyway, um, I never, ever had an idea of where I would end up. I just took the opportunities as they came and let life take me where it went. Um, And I think that the most important thing is, as Jacqueline said, I watch so many people obsess over their plan or where am I going that they become paralyzed because of the choice. I'm so happy that I am not, you know, young with all of the myriad of choices um, that you have today. And so I would say, look, you're at the, one of the best schools in the, in the entire world, and you're obviously here because you care about where we're going. And so let your values and your heart drive where you go. And I'll just pile on and just to say that uh, if the question is, you know, how do I, sitting where you're sitting, Robbie, decide where I'm going to make my mark, it is, a, a, couple, a couple additional thoughts. One is... There's sort of a, an option where you don't have to make a choice. I've been very good at this in my life. Uh, acquire some more skills. I mean, and, and that is not a cop-out. It's not to say, you know, well, I'm not going to go to development now while well, you're copying it. It is so useful for any of us engaged in what we do to have people who come from the private sector with a broad set of skills honed in the private sector. Uh, and so maybe that's kicking the can down the road a little bit, but I think there's a lot of value in that. And then, you know, it's the, as Pamela said, well, you got to have a plan, but it never turns out the way you think it's going to turn out. Uh, so what's going to be your touchstone? You sure hope it's the thing you're passionate about, genuinely passionate about, because, you know, there are so many problems in the world, and all of them, all of them need addressing, and you can't do all of them. It's like trying to manage an organization that does 
too many things. Uh, you're not going to be good at any of them. So make arbitrary choices. You, you'd love to make it. You, that's, that's how life works. And, and, and realize that, you know, there are roads not taken. And, yeah, well, that's just the nature of the game. But it's get skills, get engaged, and start is a good thing. Uh, and to the extent that you have the luxury of knowing what your passion is, that's, that's the way you ought to go. I guess my question is, let's thought about it when you were talking about introducing civil society concepts in Pakistan. Um, and so specifically, what are some lessons you've learned in trying to introduce what could be very foreign concepts in these societies as an outsider? Um, you know, is it finding your entrepreneur there and letting his actions lead? Or what sort of actions do you take to work with these groups? And then in general, for all of you, have bringing, you know, it's fantastic to bring McKinsey philosophies to agribusiness, but how do you get the local populations to really embrace and accept these? And what have you done that's been good and bad in that? Part of it is there's a catalyzing role that we can play. Uh, there are industries that need jump-starting in terms of the skill acquisition and understanding what the business model is or understanding what the linkages are into supply chains in, in, in a particular instance. Uh, and there's a catalyzing role that we can play. I think that's true for finance, too. I mean, uh, you know, long-term, uh, we wouldn't want to subsidize uh, financial investments in these companies. But in the short term, that's the game you got to play. And so in some sense, it's almost an anti-market approach to market development. But you do need that kickstart. And oftentimes it is, you know, starting a business is really friggin' hard. It's hard here. Uh, it's really hard there uh, for myriad reasons, infrastructure, there's lighting, electricity. But among other things, there's no networks. There's no peers. There's no examples of success stories. And that's part of the challenge here. It's get in here. Let's make sure we're successful. Let's apply world-class business thinking because the problems merit that. Uh, and let's create successes from that. And then you have something to emulate uh, in, in terms of thinking about, gee, am I an entrepreneur? Gee, is there a market opportunity? Gee, can I make money doing this? This is exactly why we do what we do. We choose entrepreneurs in their countries that have been successful at affecting social change because they need the legitimacy in their countries for the innovative ways they've gone about uh, implementing change. And they need to be able to be there as role models for future gener generations. And it is incredibly, incredibly important. I, I, would, just, um, I, I would just add that, um, that you don't start with what we probably did wrong in titling this thing Civil Society in the Muslim World is um, we started with our own no notions. Now we can make more mistakes like that because people trust us. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a funny combination. I would say start with n know who you are, um, but constantly start with honoring the, the people who you are trying to influence. So I one of my first uh, talks in, in Pakistan was about our venture approach and that we were charging market rates, et cetera, et cetera. And the first guy who um, responded said, that's really nice, Jacqueline, but you've just taken the love, all the love out of NG NGO. And um, I said I, that that was really shocking to me. And then the next guy told me I was a Western imperialist um, <laughs> capitalist. <laughs> and and um, so it started this whole conversation about what does that mean? And uh, and what we finally got down to was that the value system was that um, I, I cut my teeth in Rwanda. And I'm so exhausted by hearing people in particularly Africa, but all over the developed world, being classified as this poor mass of people who can't do anything, so we have to come in and solve problems. Once we had that conversation, a lot changed. Um, and so I think it's knowing who you are and where your values come from and stating them in a way that elicits discussion, um, that, that, but, but not, not moving back from it is where trust starts getting built. First is uh, uh, microfinance as it started by, uh, in Bangladesh by Dr. Yunus 25 years ago has come a long way. Uh, but when you look around the world, there are not too many um, examples where you know, a lot of people say, yeah, we've returned back this much or that much. But the actual difference it has made in large scales, uh, there are not too many examples of that. Um, and, um, and how it can actually grow to the point where 
it can actually serve as a source of connection to actual capital markets. You know, that development has been difficult. And uh, it's really, we have really haven't gotten there. We, I, you think after 25 years we'd be able to get to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so there's a lot of success stories in this, but there's a lot of failures. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you could reflect on some of those, what do you think are the key uh, stumbling blocks? Um, and second thing is just about the comment about the civil society. One of the things that um, uh, Human Development Foundation, one of its core tenets was, um, you, know, you go in there with a framework, but you really have to empower the community to define their own problems and come up with their own solutions. Because it's, you know, like one of the things with Africa has taken in about a trillion dollars over the past 50 years and just gotten sucked in these huge top-down programs, and the money's disappeared. You know, but half of it has gone to consultants. Mm -hmm. Half of it, you know, this corruption is it's disappeared. And Africa's worse than it was 50 years ago. You know, these problems have to come from the bottom. I mean, they have to be defined by the people. The people have to be empowered to like create a difference in their own lives, in their own communities. Mm -hmm. And just that's something to do with civil society. And people recognize that. The most illiterate people will tell you what they want and want to change their lives. But I absolutely agree with almost everything that you said um, in that I think the it really is about people taking control of their own lives and, and having the, the solutions. I don't think they have all of the solutions. I don't think any of us have all of the solutions. And what's so exciting about the world today is that if we listen enough to each other, and I think that's partially where you're coming from, if we really listen to each other, we can we can find those solutions together. What's so frustrating about the last 50 years of development, and and some and there have also been real successes. So it's it's also too simplistic to say nothing worked. A lot worked, and there's a lot to build on. And part of our job is to find um, those things that did work. Um, but we didn't quantify anything. So we're bringing in water technologies into India. And we've gone to all of the quote unquote experts trying to find out how much how much did people use, how much did they drink, um, what do they pay, um, and nobody can give us the data. So it's really hard to create a business plan around transferring a technology into a village area when you've got no history to build on, despite the fact that we spent thirteen billion dollars a year for the last forty years. Um, and so I would say, yes, listen and um, bringing in new technologies can completely transform a community if it's done in combination, and that's where trust comes from. Um, in terms of why don't as many microfinance organizations scale, it's why um, companies all over the world often don't scale, but even more so in the in the nonprofit sector. One management, um, finding those entrepreneurs who not only can get something through startup, but then either have the wherewithal to hire a really strong COO, the person I was talking about before. Um, or step aside and let someone else come in, uh, very small. Uh, the way that capital has been given and a, and a complete lack of metrics. Off also, um, bad money often follows good, and we've seen this with some of the things we've supported at Acumen Fund, that will create um, an extraordinary innovation with uh, an entrepreneur um, using a market-oriented approach that becomes profitable and really well-intentioned people with a lot of money get so excited by it, they come pouring in with grant money and destroy the organization. Um, or they set up a side-by-side -side one or a subsidy program, and boom, it's gone. And so they're lot, it's a complicated answer, but it's a really important question. Just on the microfinance, I think one of the leading impediments to its development is that donors don't know when to let go. In other words, they keep subsidizing the microfinance institution when they should be going out, and we've seen this with other initiatives at all, when they could become more market-oriented. But there's a fantastic example in Mexico of Compartamos. I'm, I don't know if you know it, but um, Compartamos now, it started out as a microcredit organization. It has grown to be microfinance institution. It now has a standard and poor ratings of A+, plus, and it's traded on the public market. So it's a, And it has a very strong leadership, very visionary leader, who has then turned it over to great managers because, as Jacqueline said, entrepreneurs often are not. 
think the thing I'd say about microfinance and microenterprises, I think it's a remarkable success. Remarkable. Uh, but it can't solve everything. It is remarkable for what it, in, what it can accomplish. It can bring people uh, to a s state in life where they have some day-to-day -day stability, predictability to their lives. But it is not the engine of economic growth in these countries. It, this is trading, typically. This is not creating growing and, and vibrant companies. This is selling its, in, its working capital to buy oranges to turn around and sell them at a, at a market. That's, that's the model. And it's great for that. And let's never stop doing it. And another thing that's really great about it is it's, in some sense, a silver bullet kind of approach. Once, you, once they got that model down of the delivery, the low-cost delivery of financial services, that really works. It's a hell of a lot harder when you get up into the small and medium enterprise world. It is just that there's no silver bullets. Uh, and there's, it's, as Jacqueline said, there's a whole different set of um, skills required to go from a one or two person business to running an organization. And uh, some of that, I think, we're working with some partners, Shore Banks and, and KREP in Kenya, around a model that says, let's look at the graduates of micro, micro enterprise programs, those proven entrepreneurs who really have something going, but then let's work with them. Let's figure out how we get them or someone in their companies to get to the next level. And then, by the way, let's work with financial institutions, both the microfinance institutions to come up in terms of the amount of the loans and the, and the approach to risk, and the larger financial institutions come down. They're, that is a huge problem in these countries. These larger banks, these multinational and national banks, have never had either the incentive or the skill set to lend into the small and medium enterprise market. And if you've got to find... It, we start with sort of building a credit culture, a different assess, a way to assess risk, and you've got to do that. And it's hard work. There are no silver bullets in, in, in SME finance or growing these businesses. Um, from what you've observed of um, entrepreneurs in emerging markets, um, what, what help do they need the most? Um, and um, what skill can we offer as, as MBA graduates um, in, in helping them become better at what they do? And the second thing I wanted to ask was, from your experience and from what you've observed of people in your organization, um, what previous experience has pre prepared them uh, the best for the kind of work that you guys do right now? What can MBAs offer? It depends the stage at which the entrepreneur is at. Sometimes I think um, uh, at the very startup, I think there are a lot of skills that entrepreneurs need basically focus and making sure that, you know, as Jacqueline has mentioned several times, their metrics are right, that they know how to correct, you know, and be flexible when, when they're going, and they'll need a completely different set of skills as they go along. But I can tell you that just about all of the entrepreneurs in our community um, also have something to teach MBAs. So I think it's a two-way two street. Um, what are the skills that are needed in an organization like mine? An enormous amount of stamina. Um, and uh, actually, I would say you can come from just about any background as long as you have an eagerness to learn and a humility about learning. Those are the key things and a passionate, you know, a passion to make a difference. Um, I know we tend to, you know, see the MBAs as a magic bullet. Um, and I think there are wonderful skills there, but uh, there, you know, in this kind of a in this kind of a, a, a dynamic of entrepreneurs, there there just is so much that they need in many different ways. That the most important thing is you bring in your personal qualities as well as your talents. I would just say, with respect to the first part of your question, which was, what do the entrepreneurs there on the ground need? You know, they need what entrepreneurs need. Um, they need uh, that. Oftentimes, that transfer of knowledge, which I would call, you know, global. I mean, these are world-class business skills. Why shouldn't they be understanding the same approaches to business that you're learning here? And so, that, there is a need for that. Uh, so, it's skills, it's networks, and it's capital. I mean, it is hard to get a business going if you can't get the capital to grow it. Um, with respect to the kinds of skills we need in our organization. We're, we're, we're a little different from from the Schwab Foundation. We do put a premium on business skills and on business experience uh, because that's what we do. Uh, the thing that I'd add to that, it's not so much a skill, though, or some traits, and maybe first among them would be a certain humility. 
uh, because you are bringing this sort of, let's call it, in a, any relative sense, a world-class uh, set of skills uh, to places that don't have them. But guess what? Those people got a hell of a lot going for themselves, and they are real entrepreneurs. And you know, some of the most talented people we any of us have come across have been in, you know, poor, impoverished, middle of nowhere villages, and uh, you know, they're doing things we, we can never do. And I think the second thing is a comfort with ambiguity. Um, and I don't know, that's hard to get, but. Boy, in the environments in which these entrepreneurs work, and therefore we have to work, things just the trains do. <laughs> they don't run. There are no trains. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, if it rains, that meeting isn't going to happen. Uh, or you thought you had a sort of source of financing, but it's gone. Or the government says, steps in with a massive subsidy program and wipes out, you know, the best laid business plans. So uh, the set of skills, a certain humility, and this comfort with ambiguity, which. Uh, are, are critically important. I, I, the, the only thing I would add is I do think that there's a, spe a very specific skill set that you all have around creating business plans um, and that a lot of entrepreneurs, um, at least with whom we work, in including fairly sophisticated ones, because they don't assume that the banks will deal with them, they don't often have business plans. And so not to do it for them, but to really develop the coaching skills as well as the financial skills um, to do it with them. Uh, that's a really important, certainly it's how we use MBAs. Um, another area that we use MBAs is um, trying to collate some of this, in, this market research information. And I would say if any of you have teams um, in your schools now that would want to help us with some of the kind of searching around the world and even finding ways to build some research capacity, that's a, it's a really important piece. And then third, um, in terms of where you go to get skills, and, and part of your question, I think, was about previous experience. Um, the name of the game is distribution. So anything you can learn about supply chain management mm -hmm. and, um, and distribution, whether it's joining a consumer company, a Unilever, a, a Coca-Cola, um, that's where a lot of really interesting things are going to be happening. The other two areas, if I were your age, that I'd be looking at right now um, is healthcare in India, um, energy efficiency in China. And um, anything that is focused on very, very high volume and low margin products and services. So I think that those would be the three things. Can I add one thing here? I think that um, when you say healthcare in India and, and energy in China, um, I'm, I'm struck about how much those are needed here. I mean, uh, you know. Absolutely. I, yeah. So, so uh, I'm very worried about about this country. I'm, um, I live abroad, and it's awful to come back many times. So I think that um, as much talent as you can to really invest in getting this country back on its moral leadership track will be very important. But, but part of the, um, I think part of the issue is, and part of the work is to get Americans to understand sure. that a lot of the solutions are going to be coming from countries like India, China, um, Brazil, and that that to have this back and forth is so exciting because we're going to be innovating based on those innovations that are coming from other places, and that's going to take some humility. No to. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. My question is, how do you feel like business and social entrepreneurship um, is or has the potential to affect domestic poverty? So it's a segue based on your question, because I'm always uh, listening for that in sustainability conferences and business conferences, and I hear a lot about in indigenous and in microfinance outside of this country, mm -hmm. and yet the gap between the rich and the poor is growing astronomically right here. And I'm curious what you think an MBA student might be able to go out in, the, in, in this country, and what kind of change that you think we might have, what kind of potential effect you think we could have. I don't have all the answers. But <laughs> a couple thoughts. One is there are, in fact, very active microfinance organizations in this country doing work in – right down the road in East Palo Alto, a startup, which has actually started here, uh, is doing very good work. Axion has a uh, microfinance program. It's a very different model. It's a lot harder to do because the loan sizes are a lot bigger. Uh, you don't have the sort of peer lending model, which is such a uh, great guarantor of repayments. A lot of challenges in that. Um, Again, let me just suggest one other thing, and it's a little bit of a radical notion. We do have, unfortunately, they're being dismantled, uh, but we do have social safety nets uh, that are often administered by the government. 
Nobody goes in. Talented people don't go into government. And look, none of you are going to run off and go into government, uh, but it's a shame because the lack of management skills within governments and within, I mean, among public servants who are well-meaning, and you know, God, they, they have to be, um, but who just don't have the skill sets necessary to really affect real positive, sustainable change uh, is uh, it's appalling. Um, and again, I don't, I wouldn't do it. Uh, but uh, it's needed. <laughs> All right, let me jump in there. Um, <laughs> um, I actually recently had a conversation with Elliot Spitzer, who's um, running for governor in New York, and he is really interested in a venture approach to solving problems of education, poverty in New York State. I think we're going to see some really interesting younger politicians that Bruce McNamer is going to eat his words on because he may end up working for him. Um, <laughs> That we, we should be paying attention to. That's part of what we need to do in this country is, is find those leaders who are thinking in those kinds of innovative ways. Um, after Katrina, a number of people called us to say, help us think through this venture approach as well. So it's partially getting out and doing it, and it's finding great leaders and attaching yourself to them. Sarah Horowitz is this great woman who um, started essentially walking you know, insurance and pension plans for the self-employed. It's called uh, Working Today. Uh, look it up. It, she's, she's an inspiration. Um, whether it's the finding the d domestic Ashoka Fellows or the MacArthur uh, Fellows, even as a starting point to see some examples of how really innovative entrepreneurs, whether they exist in the private sector, public sector, or um, nonprofit sector, are thinking about solving big problems. Um, I would say find them, attach yourself to them, and do whatever it takes to learn from them because. Mm -hmm. This is where the United States needs to go to. I mean, it's one world. And Bruce, I know you're going to work in government, so. <laughs> <laughs> and think about writing for office, I should say, too. <laughs> I, I, I would just. <laughs> I very he often eat like my words when Jacqueline's around. <laughs> um, but I guess what I'm, I'm talking about is something that we see in the developing world too, which is a paucity of any um, managerial talent at the not at the even the elected level, but at the civil service at the civil service yeah. level. And um, to the extent that those the Elliott Spitzers of the world can, uh, in some systematic way, up the level and with our help, with your help, I think that would be. Important. I come from a little different background, um, international relations and Pacific studies at UC San Diego. And kind of a good segue from the political um, question that we just had was how often do you run into political impediments in these developing countries? I know that you mentioned France, and I have some experience in France myself. Um, and I, I mean, coming from the U.S. and the very open business environment we have, and then going into these developing countries is a myriad of problems. How often do you run into those problems, and how do you solve them? We don't run into the problems. The social entrepreneurs that are working on the ground have huge problems. And um, just from the point of view of the legislative environment that uh, countries um, have that, you know, as you've seen the World Bank studies in terms of how many days does it take to open an enterprise and all of these kinds of things, facilitating um, <coughs> the uh, infrastructure that's going to allow social enterprise or enterprise period to bloom is a, a huge a huge issue. Um, entrepreneurs in many countries are looked upon with suspicion. Uh, they unfortunately certainly in Latin America where I was born and brought up um, they are looked on as uh, crooks and so there is an enormous impediment to actually getting over that mindset that looks at them as crooks. They're always, the, you know, the corruption that's gone on, and I, maybe it's, I think it's very, quite different in the United States, but that's quite pervasive throughout the developing world because many entrepreneurs, in fact, have used, you know, connections and payoffs and, and are corrupt in order to build big businesses. So uh, there's a whole mind shift that needs to change. But on the other hand, there is an enormous excitement about the possibility. Every country I go to, what's the hot topic? Innovation. Innovation, innovation. They can't get enough of innovation. And the only way they're going to be able to actually stimulate innovation is through encouraging the kinds of, you know, support, either the legal, uh, you know, taxation, et cetera, that's going to um, really promote the entrepreneurs to flourish in the good sense. My question is really around sort of the macro level approach to development. 
as experienced professionals in this field, what do you see as ways that we can improve sort of our governmental coordination of development, whether it's through organizations like the IMF or World Bank, or whether it's through how the U.S. doles out um, development aid? And then how can you guys, as leaders of entrepreneurial grassroots-oriented development organizations, affect that? Well, in some sense, it's a, it's a great question. And in some sense, it related to the previous question. Uh, I mean, I was going to say, with respect to the previous question, assume that politics will get in the way, always. <laughs> that's part of that your terrain you're in when you're working in these countries. Um, in, ideally, you would have kind of a macro approach to the problems of poverty and a micro approach as well. Right. I think you need both, uh, bottom up and top down. Top down takes so long. you got to start. <laughs> so you start at the bottom. Now, in terms of how you affect the top-down agenda, um, I think there are, I mean, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, I, think, I think it's a good model. It rewards good behavior, but it can't be the answer because you risk, the sole answer, because you risk leaving behind millions of poor people who have the misfortune to be born in countries that are, where corruption still reigns rampant. But in terms of beginning to affect change, uh, I think this reward for good behavior is a, is a good thing. I think things like visibility, this doing business report that the World Bank does, um, that Pamela referred to, it is really remarkable. It is some very prosaic measures of what it's like to do business in a country. How long does it take to get incorporated in Uganda? How, how much, what percentage of uh, your annual income do you have to pay to actually just get registered uh, in Mozambique? These measures, and then they're all stacked, countries are rated against each other. And you see from year to year the effect that that very public comparison has. It's really remarkable. So next year, you know, Kyrgyzstan has really taken to heart the fact that it takes 140 days to get a business registered, and it's down to seven days because they're, com they're competing. Um, so I think it, it's really, it, you know, Jacqueline was talking about measurement. You, once you can measure it, then you can actually see and you can compare, and maybe you can do something about it. Um, but it's a, you know, Getting the enabling environment right would be great, and it's such a challenge in these environments because nothing is as it is here or as it should be. And Jack was talking about land titling. I mean, okay. how do you how do you borrow money when you don't have title to a land yeah. to land? How do you run a business if you can't borrow money? But you know, these systems of land entitlement are, for, whether for reasons for history of corruption, I just I'm, I'm belaboring the point that the the need is critical. But you can't wait for it, and I think there are emerging approaches to it that aren't going to be a complete answer, um, but that do have good effect. Just on, on that note, um, I think when we talk about government, I mean, the whole issue is bottom-up is not enough and top-down doesn't do it. So how do you actually get these to come together and to work? Um, the issue is that especially entrepreneurs are innovators. Governments support the status quo. And I've never seen this happen as much as I did when I was in the UN system, which if we shut it down tomorrow, maybe we'd have more resources. But the issue is it's a very inept, it's, it, because its, it's board of directors are the governments themselves, and there are vested interests in keeping the way that things are. It is extremely difficult to affect change in those institutions, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the IMF, whether it's any of these. So. I'm less um, optimistic, and I tend to be overly optimistic usual, ex unless we talk about government. Um, so I, I don't know to what degree, uh, I just hope that the new generation of leaders will come in and really want to do things for their country. And I see this happening in many African countries. It gives me tremendous excitement and hope. Problem is, it can't happen fast enough. So. Um, as long as the entrepreneurs are driving the change and making governments some exciting people with, you know, their outrageous audacity, we hope that um, things will change. Um, two little um, pieces of hope, because it, it is quite a, it's quite daunting. I, I do think there's power in this notion of blueprints, um, of being very specifically focused on finding ways to show how large-scale change can come about. Um, when you do measure what the private sector can do, what the subsidy, smart subsidy is um, that's required. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the last, I'd say in the last five years, we've seen large institutions at least try to change. Um, we're hearing them talk about market-oriented um, approaches, 
grassroots business organizations or something like that the yeah. uh, the IFC I is see. doing there there are small changes that are starting to be made so it's um, it's getting smarter at building the data, I think, or I hope, around um, what some of these blueprints are, being more savvy then about using media and shaming. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity that we have in the world today, again, with this communication. And so to be both optimistic and proactive in, in finding the solutions and then aggressive and focused at lifting um, where we're seeing corruption and the stuff that nobody wants um, in any country. And so I, I think there's some real potential for change and hope. And then the final thing is, it's, it's kind of micro and small, but in terms of what you can only do what you can do. Um, but some of these partnerships, uh, we have one which is really hard where we work with big corporations and UN organizations, but being the little gadfly at the table is a, a really important and, and not fun but um, interesting place to be mm -hmm. because you can learn how to help the innovators at those big institutions navigate through their institutions. And, again, it's it's small, but the more we learn the, and the more we know key players, at least the more hope there is that we're going to have some honest discussions. How do you guys pay your bills? Uh, who funds you? <laughs> 90 days late. <laughs> We, uh, this year, are about a $20 million organization. About 65% of that is public sector funding. So that comes from the AIDs of the world, the DFIDs, the British, the Swiss, multilaterals, World Bank, IDB. And we're about, the balance is private sector funding. It's uh, corporations, it's foundations. We have 17,000 small donors giving us 30, 40 bucks a year. Wow. Um, I mean, that's, so we do direct mail. I mean, uh, Every, I'll tell you, every little bit helps. I'll tell you the thing about private sector funding, which is critical. I don't see us continuing to grow um, being in a world where we will have no public sector funding. There's just, there is a lot of public sector funding that is available to help the poor. Um, the, the beautiful thing about private sector funding is it enables you to be innovative in your approaches to try things that you otherwise couldn't try with public funding. And it's remarkable the extent to which increasingly private sector funding leverages uh, public sector money. So there's a GDA program at USAID, which is it's about public-private party. That's what they're promoting. To the extent that you can come to the table with a private sector donor, you can leverage your money two, three, four times. Uh, so it is a catalyst for uh, mobilizing resources, and in, in that sense, it's critical to us. Jacqueline, you talk uh, about um, measurement, and there's a lot, there's a big growing movement in the U.S. around social metrics, especially for large corporations, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about measurement in international development in the social entrepreneurship in the development field, um, whether th if that's more project-based or uh, larger kind of uh, cross-country applications of uh, measuring success. Um, so that's one question. The second question is a little bit more to Bruce. And a lot of your work is around um, helping to develop these SMEs uh, from the grassroots. but. Do you see a, a more of a growing movement to help develop new business models for the larger corporations who may be targeting um, BOP markets as, as well? And um, is, is there, you know, growing work or, uh, you know, a strategy towards that? I think the field is still pretty nascent in terms of, of metrics. Um, at Acumen Fund, we are insistent and um, and, and very, very focused on measuring everything that we can, as I said. Um, and I, I think it's more, ten times more important today than I thought it was when we started, which is not to say that we have the answers. Um, just starting with a stake in the ground on output puts you ahead of the game from a lot of organizations in terms of saying, all right, we gave $350,000 loan to a malaria bed net factory in Africa, and... Now that factory is making 3 million nets, 2,000 jobs, $2, two million dollars of new wages into the economy. It's a good, and we've gotten all our money back. So it's a, it's a good quote unquote investment. We don't have the money yet, um, and I'm not sure we want it, um, but we do want partners who will then help us measure. So are those women, anecdotally, we know they're sending their kids to school and they're building houses. Um, anecdotally, we can extrapolate, we think, um, that if you've sold, if you've given, if 
three million people now have nets. That's about six million cases of malaria that may or may not have been averted, but we're not really sure. Um, we know that's a good thing, What's impo- what, but what we are starting to develop, which is an important thing, um, is what we're calling BACO, the best alternative charitable option. And that is to say, <laughs> I didn't make it up, um, but, <laughs> um, but this brilliant guy on my team did. Um, that is to say, we can show you how much it costs us to deliver a bed net to a poor person. Um, and we can, we can also amortize that over the five years that that bed, bed net is going to be effective. And then we're going to tell you what the best alternative is out there on the marketplace today, which is primarily a charitable marketplace. And then maybe policy, policymakers, back to your question, will take note that it is so easy to say, let's give these all free and they cost $5 and it's going to cost another $5 in consultants and what have you to deliver it, or you can sell them on this at this price point and um, it will cost you X. And so the more we can get better at um, putting stakes in the ground to try to figure out the kinds of metrics that will help us do our own work, the more we're going to push conversations as to how larger scale resources are allocated, hopefully, both on the micro level, at least for us, but also on the macro level for policy. Yeah, I think on the multinational, you know, merging business models, um, the bottom of the pyramid concept is one with which we're all increasingly familiar, and a lot of that emphasis on that is poor as a market uh, for consumer goods. Um, but there are multinational corporations who are thinking about how that flows the other way, right? It is the poor as part of my supply chain, uh, because that actually creates economic activity. You're creating assets, you're creating wealth at the bottom of the pyramid when you're encouraging the kind of economically um, – uh, sustainable endeavors that would supply and would, that would put money into that supply chain. Now, it's not as – so we work in that. We, and sometimes that is just pure market-based. We work with Olam, which is one of the largest supply chain – agricultural supply chain companies in the world. They're sourcing cashews from uh, Mozambique where they haven't before. And it's all, it is for-profit. Pete's, the Pete's example I gave, that is for-profit. That is – that's a great source of high-premium coffee for them, and it's a source they didn't have before. Oftentimes, so what we see is that – you know, for some of these multinationals, the, um, the quantity of supply you can get out of a small country like Honduras is so infinitesimal in a relative sense that, you know, why bother? It might even be profitable. But this is, I think, where there's a, a good dovetailing of your corporate social responsibility with what you do as a business. And so what we see is partners who come in and say, all right, you know, <laughs> my real interest is in Brazil. Um, but... I am thinking as a corporate good citizen, I do want to put some subsidy into what I do. And, you know, okay, I'll make the investment here because it's actually consistent with my line of business. So you see that as well. Bruce, Pamela, Jacqueline, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you.